stage here at COGX. I hope you've been enjoying the morning already into lunchtime. Uh, can you believe it? Or perhaps the second half of the day uh, for others. Thank you so much for coming and joining this session. Um, we are going to be focusing on privacy preserving machine learning, having your cake and eating it too. And you're going to have a familiar face in Libby Kinsey coming back to moderate this session. If you were here yesterday, you remember she moderated uh, the brilliant session on planetary technologies. Um, but yes, here we're going to be talking about privacy preserving machine learning and when it is useful. Just to remind you all, you can join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag. This is a session that's going to have a Q&A session attached to it. So please do submit your questions in the Slido while the speakers are chatting and of course um, later on in the Q&A too. But great to get your questions in whenever you're ready. Um, and with that, I'll pass on to Libby. Enjoy the show. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on the cutting edge stage at Co COGX this year. Uh, my name is Libby Kinsey. I am a technologist at Digital Catapult and an independent consultant and researcher. In this session called Privacy Preserving Machine Learning, Having Your Cake and Eating It, we're going to look at whether you can build effective machine learning models whilst protecting sensitive or uh, private data. Um, we're going to do it with three talks from our, um, three guest speakers, and they'll cover applications, uh, solutions, and technologies, and then move into a discussion. Um, so let's get started. Our first speaker is Oliver Smith. He is Strategy Director and Head of, Head of Essex at Telefonica Alpha Health. Um, and he'll be talking about the use cases for privacy preserving machine learning that he's looked at. Over to you, Oliver. Thanks, Libby. It's uh, great to be here, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, so having your cake and eating it, which is uh, obviously what everyone's keen on. And in the, the line of work I'm in, that means can we create great digital healthcare that actually doesn't require any private data at all? Uh, so let, let's take a look at my presentation and uh, we'll go through um, a bit of background on, on Alpha. Uh, a little bit of um, why we think privacy preserving machine learning is important. And then finally, what we've been looking at and, and what we think. So in terms of Alpha, Alpha is, is part of Telefonica. So Telefonica is a global telecommunications company. And they set up Alpha ooh, back in 2016 as their disruptive innovation unit, their moonshot facility. Uh, as we call ourselves. And we're based here in Barcelona. Uh, that's our building, which I haven't been in for a long time now. Um, but I'm, I'm in Alpha Health. And Alpha Health is, is focused on trying to really radically improve access to, to great healthcare and using digital technology to do that. Just to give you a little bit of context of that, we've got four products in our portfolio at the moment. The first of these is, is, is called Evermind, which is, is really about self-care and it's focused on helping people with, with their stress. Uh, the second is, is Perspectives, which is digital cognitive behavioral therapy. And, and this one's unsupervised. So as you would imagine, it, it's going through clinical trial at the moment. It then has a sister application, which is called Mindset, which is actually for supervised digital uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. So in this one, a doctor supports, supports your care. And then finally, we have a product we're working on called Foresight, which is using uh, data to actually predict whether someone would have a crisis. And of course, that then allows a, a clinician to, to do something about it and so hopefully avoid that crisis. So the purpose of really showing you this is, is to, I hope, demonstrate that it's obvious that across all of this, this portfolio of, of, of mental health applications, they are applications that will require data if we're able to actually personalize and improve the product. And that got us thinking about, well, wouldn't it be great if we could actually avoid sucking in lots of, lots of personal data and actually get to privacy preserving machine learning as, as part of what we do. So let me say a little bit more about how we see PPML and why we're doing it. There are there's lots of different technologies for privacy preserving machine learning. I'll, I'll go through a few of the ones we've looked at in, in a moment. But in terms of what we are looking for from it, we see it as it's the training and deployment of models without actually requiring access to any personal data and crucially without any detrimental impact on model performance or user experience. And this for us is, is but one part of actually what we're looking at in, in, our, in our ethics work. Uh, we also look at 
um, new design patterns, particularly thinking about consent. Yes, we look at technology that we want to embed into our products, and that includes uh, privacy preserving AI or, or machine learning, as well as explainable AI. And then finally, we also have uh, uh, an aspect of our of our ethical work, which is which is really about audit and governance. And we have um, external audit, and we use a company again based here in Barcelona called Ethicas to to do those audits. Uh, hopefully, you can't see that little pop up. Um, this is all underpinned by uh, a framework of, of principles and commitments that, that we have. And the, re the reason why we put so much effort into this is because we think that without this ethical approach, without building trust, we're just not going to have the impact that, that we want to have. We're not going to be able to improve access to, to great quality healthcare. Most people will think of this in terms of data access, and, and of course, that, that is really important. If, if people don't trust us, then they're not going to give us access to their data, uh, and, and therefore we won't be able to great, build great products. But it also affects other aspects. Effectiveness is, is a good example. Um, thinking of Evermind, for instance, if there's a, a part of that product, it's, it's journaling, where people write down their thoughts, and it's an important part of, uh, of care. Um, and of course, if you don't trust that that, that, that data is going to be to be managed correctly, held privately, then, then you won't write down your thoughts openly and you, and you won't get the real benefit. So that's, that's really why we've got into to privacy preserving machine learning and why we set up a, a team here in Alpha Health to, to look at that. And what we've been doing over the past year or so really is just exploring different technologies. Uh, so let me let me start, oh, actually, no, sorry. Let me go through our goals for, uh, for pre privacy preserving machine learning first. Obviously, we wanted to preserve privacy. Uh, clearly, that that's what we're gonna want. But also, we want to be able to apply uh, privacy preserving ML to both training and inference on, on a range of machine learning techniques. So not, not just, um, uh, say, logarithmic regression, but also neural networks. As, as I mentioned earlier, we just don't want any worsening of performance versus non-PPML approaches. We don't want any worsening of user experience. So we don't want there to be lots of battery drain. If it's using lots of computational power on the mobile, that slows everything down. That's, of course, not great for users. We want to be able to protect our IP as a company. And ideally, we want it to be easy to implement. So, OK, now, now let me go through some of those, those technologies. So I said we, we've looked at six. Really struggled to try and get it down into a sentence each, but 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 um, I think I've just about managed it. So of course there's data anonymization, so you remove all personal data before machine learning is applied. There's differential privacy, adding a lot of noise to the data so that you're obfuscating it. There's secure multi-party computation where you are randomly splitting the data into different parts, and it's then machine learning is applied on, on different servers, and, and then you bring it together. You've got homomorphic encryption, uh, where you are applying the machine learning directly to the encrypted data. So you don't need to de-encrypt it before you do the machine learning. You've got secure enclaves. Uh, and for us, in, in, a, in a mobile environment, that means on the, on the phone, there is, there is hardware, there's a chip. Uh, we send our, our model to the chip, and the user's data from the phone goes into the, to, to the chip as well. And it's all, all the machine learning happens there. And we can't see everything, and neither can the user see everything. And then finally, the technique I think a lot of people are familiar with is, is federated learning where the model is sent to the edge. So for us, the model is sent to the mobile phone and we're not receiving the data in the center. I know that Blaze and Hassan, who are going to be speaking a bit later, are going to say more about secure multi-party computation uh, and federated learning. But in terms of what we were looking for, we, we try to assess them in overall terms uh, what do we think is going to be right for us? And given given those uh, given those criteria that I went through earlier, what's going to be the best approach for us? Uh, so we created this 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 chart. I have to say, Sebas in 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 our team hates this because he says this this is just too high level. This doesn't do justice to uh, the different um, the, the nuances. Uh, you're trying to look at a kind of general use case rather than uh, kind of specific use cases. Uh, so so he hates this, but but. The reason why I wanted to present this is because it, 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 for us, when we were looking at what we need for Alpha Health, we just thought, well, there isn't really a, a winner here. Uh, there isn't one technology that we just think, wow, if we just use this, then we can have privacy preserving machine learning. And I would say another couple of points on this is that um, 
this hasn't been updated with the latest on uh, what IBM's just been doing on homomorphic encryption. And I know that the open mind community is working really hard on, on training on the edge from federated machine learning. This is an area that, that's moving all the time. Uh, and really that, that speaks to, to, to where we've got to. And, and we've decided that, well, firstly, we, we, we just need to explore a combination of techniques. I think we're going to have secure multi-party multi computation at the core. Uh, we we'll bring in elements of others. But one aspect that we've, that we've learned as well that's really important is that um, it's super use case sensitive. And actually, my dream that I had that we could just take one technology and apply it to one of our use cases is not really right. And we should be being much more use case sensitive. Some of the companies that we've worked with, you know, Duality and Homomorphic Encryption and Aphoris on Federated Machine Learning, and they've got some great technology. And I think they'd be, they'd be perfect for specific use cases that we're developing. And so that's that's something we want to follow up as well, because you know, we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And finally, we also just need to consider other aspects of our ethical approach. And um, one of the, the big debates we had on the team is explainable AI. And can you have XAI and PPAI together in the same product? Um, we think probably not yet, but we think uh, that is something that is going to be possible. So just, just to conclude, I think overall, sorry, Libby, but we still do need to choose between having or eating our cake. But it is changing fast. Uh, and, we think, uh, and we think we will see that we will be able to do those two things very soon. Um, so that, that's the end of the presentation from me. Thank you very much. And uh, um, back to Libby. Thank you. Well, we can stop here. We've answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Oliver. Um, that was an absolutely perfect motivation for the why of privacy preserving machine learning. We're now going to move on to Blaze Thompson. Blaze is CEO and founder of Bitfount, um, which is a startup enabling companies to share data whilst maintaining privacy and control. Over to you, Blaze. Thank you, Libby. Um, well, and I'm also very excited to, to be here on the stage and cutting edge talking about privacy preserving machine learning. Um, I'm going to take a, a slightly different angle to Oli and focus a little bit more around data sharing uh, between companies. And so here, um, th this is another area where I think privacy preserving machine learning can be used. And I think it can be used uh, for the better of all because I actually think that there are a lot of cases where data sharing in some sense is very good. So if we can uh, head over to my, my presentation, uh, I'll run you th through some of my thinking uh, and then some of the things that we're doing uh, at Bitfund. So um, first off, why is data sharing a good thing, especially uh, between companies? Well, I think there are many, many problems where the more data you have, uh, the, the better a machine learning algorithm is. So this is one of, of many examples I've taken um, where, where people are building a classifier. And as the number of examples increases by a factor of 10, the, the metric that they're interested in, in this case, the average precision, uh, keeps going up. And this has been seen in, in many cases. This is an object recognition task. But it's been seen in speech recognition, machine translation. And it seems almost that every machine learning task that uh, we follow actually has this property. And I think this has very interesting implications for, for our economy. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that in the context of companies and why they should be considering sharing some of their data. So first off, in any company, I think if you have a competitor company in the similar industry and you have some task that, that both of you have similar data for, if you're able to share those data sets, you would have an improvement in, in accuracy. And so I think that results in an immediate benefit for customers where uh, companies that do share parts of their data uh, will be able to have better user experiences and better products. But I think that also comes to a, a second aspect, which has a, a big impact on economies, which is that uh, if you have a, an, an industry where people aren't sharing data, then whoever is the market leader in that space um, has a very strong uh, reinforcing effect where they'll become more and more a monopoly. So because they have the most data, they're likely to have the best product, and therefore users are likely to, to move towards them. And so I think that that actually leads to a, another reason for companies to share data, which is if you're worried about 
the market leader in your space becoming a monopoly, then there's a really strong incentive uh, for all the other companies in that space to, to share the data. Of course, there are big problems with, with sharing data and, and they're really to do with privacy and control of the data. And I think um, what Libby's question is doing for us is asking, well, are there ways that we can share some of the benefits of data um, without risking this privacy and control? I think um, it's also worth think spending a little bit of time thinking about what actually we mean by privacy. Um, so people talk about a right to privacy, uh, but actually that's something that's not necessarily agreed uh, by everyone, that this should be a right. Um, and even some, some very famous philosophers think that although we do want to have privacy, the right to privacy is really captured by many other rights that we, we think about. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, privacy in the context of freedom, which is another thing that we all care about and we believe we have a right to. <clears throat> and if my argument that, um, that not sharing data has a risk of resulting in monopoly, then I think it actually means that being too careful about privacy without um, thinking about this aspect of its implications for monopoly has a, an important risk to our freedom. So I think there are really good political reasons as well as business reasons to, um, to think about ways that we can share at least the insights of data. Of course, it is true that we also don't want to, to risk what we consider important privacy aspects. And so um, that's where all these new technologies come in. So I wanted um, at some point in, in our three presentations to, to give a little bit of an insight into at least one of these at a more technical level, because I think some of these ideas are really elegant and very simple as well. So I want to explain in a little bit more detail how multi-party computation works at a high level. And so imagine now that you have two, um, two people, each of whom has uh, a salary, which they want to keep private, but they are happy to have a third person work out the average salary. And so multi-party computation allows this to be done just by having person X and Y uh, share a random number, uh, which we'll call R. And then they each share something with the, uh, the person in the middle. In this case, uh, person X is sending X plus R and person Y is sending Y minus R. And what's really neat in this um, is that now the, the controller in the, in the center is able to cal calculate X plus Y just by adding these two numbers together because they don't know what R is. Um, they're unable to work out what either X or Y is. And, uh, and the result is that this person in the center, of course, uh, has now been able to calculate the average salary. Um, this is, as Oli mentioned, just one of many new methods coming out, uh, including adding noise, uh, so differential privacy. Um, instead of agreeing a random number, the people would just add a, a random number themselves with zero mean. And then with enough samples, the controller would be able to uh, calculate the average. Um, and, and all these different techniques, I think they're actually into, um, conceptually quite simple, but result in really good guarantees uh, on people's privacy. Uh, of course, as Oli mentioned, there, there are a lot of difficulties in, in implementing all of these things. And so that's why uh, various different companies have been looking into ways that we could make this much easier. And uh, so in my company, Bitfound, we've been focusing on, on building up a platform to make it easy and secure to, to share these kinds of data insights. Of course, because we're, we're focusing on this, this uh, business setting instead of in the, the case of individual users, we've realized that uh, one of the important things is, is to build up trust. And so our approach has actually been to, to find individual domain partners um, for a specific area and then build up a, a kind of a joint platform uh, for, for particular domains. Uh, so one example of this is a, a really great company called Alpha. This is a slightly different Alpha from, uh, from the one Ali presented. You'll see there's an F instead of a, a PH. Um, and they're uh, the market leader in, in building asset finance uh, software provided to, to many large uh, companies. And so we're working with Alpha to, to bring this to the asset finance space. 
um, but also exploring other opportunities in other domains um, to, to look at uh, applying this technology and these ideas in particular spaces. So um, I, I would actually say that from my perspective, I think there are aspects of the cake that we are able to, um, to eat uh, while, while having it, but uh, it's, it's not so simple. And as Ali says, uh, we do need to, to be a little bit careful in the way that we do it. So I'll hand back to, uh, to Libby and uh, thank you all for, um, for having me for this talk. Thank you very much, Blaise. I'm going to move straight on to our next talk so that we can get into this discussion. Our final uh, talk is from um, Hassan Mahmoud. He is Senior Technologist for AI and Machine Learning at Digital Catapult. And he's going to be talking about building a platform independent demonstrator of federated learning. Over to you, Hassan. Uh, thanks, Libby. And uh, like the rest, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, shall we start my presentation? Uh, okay, right, great. Okay, so let's get started. So, um, so in the next 10 minutes, uh, um, uh, I'll be talking about federated learning and how you can sort of develop uh, platform independent libraries and open ecosystem for it, and uh, also about why exactly we'd want to sort of do those things. Um, okay, so like Libby said, uh, I work at Digital Catapult, and Digital Catapult uh, is a UK nonprofit uh, with the goal of uh, helping accelerate adoption of advanced technologies like AI, DLT, 5G by UK businesses. And uh, within the uh, within the, uh, the AI team at Digital Catapult, one of the things that we are sort of interested in is ethical AI. And uh, so, and um, uh, yeah, and so federated learning is obviously a really a great technology for uh, doing privacy, 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 machine learning. And uh, to that end, we sort of uh, wanted to quickly build uh, sort of a multi-device federated learning demonstrator for our clients. And one thing that we quickly realized is that it's actually much easier to sort of build one from scratch. So we explored the current frameworks that are available, uh, and we realized that it's actually uh, much easier to sort of build a library from scratch. And um, the experience of building this library and also sort of uh, looking at the existing uh, the frameworks that uh, exist right now, uh, it became really quickly clear to us that um, it's actually a really good idea to um, uh, tr to try to build and encourage people to build open source platform independent libraries and open ecosystems for federated learning. And the reason for that is um, because we believe that down the line, it will avoid fragment, uh, fragmentation of the federated learning solution space, uh, allow inter interoperability of the different uh, uh, solutions that people develop, help create a health ecosystem, uh, which would allow for uh, innovation and adoption of the learning across the board and possibly enable uh, new kinds of business models that we haven't actually thought about right now and uh, give end users many choices. Yeah, so essentially everybody wins. Uh, yeah, so then the question is, um, how do we actually go about building such open platforms, such open ecosystems? And the first step is to actually sort of tease out what's actually common to all federated learning systems. And once we do that, um, uh, we can collaboratively define APIs and infrastructures uh, that are common and then implement the common core and then sort of uh, build on the common core, whether you're sort of actually developing commercial applications or doing research and experimentation, you start with the common core and then you sort of build on top of that. So how do we actually uh, tease out what's actually uh, common between all federated learning systems? Uh, the way you can do that is by looking at uh, such systems at a high level and in particular looking at um, uh, a federated training iteration and then uh, try to understand what's actually, uh, what, what, the, what, the, what the different dependencies are uh, when you actually look at uh, federated uh, learning. Um, okay, so let's do that. Uh, so just to get started, uh, this is what federated learning looks like uh, at a high level. So you have a set of clients uh, or a set of workers. So in this part, in the slide, I think you're you're seeing three, but in general, it could be sort of millions. Or uh, 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 yeah, so it, it can number millions, it can number hundreds, it can be uh, 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 yeah, it can be a lot. And so the idea is that each of these clients or workers have a local machine learning model, and they also have their own private data that they do not want to share with uh, with anyone else. Uh, and the goal within federated learning is to create a central global model at, at the server using the data from all the different workers, and uh, but without actually looking at the data. 
So uh, federated learning sort of, uh, it, that's a goal of federated learning, so, okay. So given that that's a goal, so let's look at how we actually sort of do that. So what I'm going to show you now are sort of um, five typical, uh, five steps that you typically take uh, during like a standard federated learning uh, training iteration. Okay, so uh, as a first step, uh, the workers use, uh, uh, update their local machine learning models using the data they have available locally. Remember that this data is sort of private to each worker and uh, they don't actually want, uh, yeah, and so the idea is to not uh, share the share this uh, private data. So as a first step, the machine learning, uh, each of the workers uh, train a local model based on the local data that they have and the machine learning models could be quite different across the board. Uh, the second step, uh, the workers send the, uh, the, the local update that they did to their models uh, to the central server. <clears throat> uh, the server then aggregates the local updates into the uh, global model. And after that, the server sends the model updates back to the worker. And finally, uh, the worker then inc incorporates a global update into the local model. <clears throat> so that this, those are the five steps in a typical federated learning uh, training iteration. Uh, now the question is like what are the dependencies in this, this instances? And what I'll show uh, really uh, right now uh, in, in the following slides is that we can identify three different kinds of uh, dependencies in, in, in a system like this. Uh, the first dependency is uh, a dependency on the application. Uh, for instance, uh, whether you're doing predator learning for in medicine or in finance or, or, uh, or, yeah, whatever, or in manufacturing, whatever the application might be. Uh, the second dependency we'll see is uh, will be on the tip actual federated learning algorithm you're using. And the third is sort of, uh, we'll see that there are components that are bits, there are sort of parts of the system that are actually common across all federated learning systems. And yeah, and so, yeah, we want to sort of tease out what this, uh, which bits, uh, which parts of the system are uh, sort of, uh, what the dependencies are. Right, uh, so let's look, uh, so we go back to uh, the iteration. Uh, the, so in the first step, when the local models are, uh, local, uh, the workers are updating their uh, local models in the local data. So that bit is, depends on the specific application that you're using. Uh, in the second step, uh, when the workers send their updates to the server, um, uh, the actual mess type of the message is sent, they're common across all federated learning systems. So this message, message type is, uh, uh, there are sort of uh, actual sort of uh, binary strings that are sort of uh, like uh, that are model updates or uh, inf messages related to worker authentication and so on. Uh, but the actual content of the messages that exchange uh, sent from the worker to the server, that actually depends on the federated learning algorithm. <clears throat> Uh, when the server uh, aggregates uh, local updates into the global model, that is that depends only on the algorithm itself. And again, when the server sends back the updates to the workers, uh, the message type is common across all federated learning systems, but the actual message content depends on the uh, uh, actual federated learning algorithm. <clears throat> and finally, when the uh, workers incorporate the global upda update back to the model, uh, uh, into the local model, uh, that's again depends on the federated learning algorithm. So looking at this, so okay, so like I said, uh, there are three kinds of dependencies we can identify, and uh, this immediately suggests adopting a sort of layered architecture for federated learning, where um, <clears throat> at the bottom layer you have the communication backend, uh, which is like a scalable API that handles the exchange of standard federated learning, uh, federated learning messages uh, in a secure manner. Uh, and on top of that, you have the uh, the algorithm layer that sort of uses the primitives provided by the backend to um, uh, implement specific algorithms. And finally, you have the application layer that uses the um, uh, uh, uses the um, uh, the algorithm layer to uh, for specific applications. So the idea is that uh, the communication the communication uh, layer is sort of common across uh, all different uh, all different federated learning systems. We can actually sort of uh, collectively or collaboratively sort of define what the APIs are, what the requirements are, what the uh, what the uh, what the requirements are, and sort of build that collectively and define like a standard API for that. And then uh, people are sort of free to sort of implement the algorithms or application layer however they want, or maybe there may be sort of ecosystem of different kinds of uh, algorithms and so on. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, at this, so I think I mentioned at the beginning that we actually built a library ourselves, like a proof of concept library, and that's called DC Federated. Uh, so, yeah, so this this library actually illustrates uh, all the concepts uh, in in like a really uh, small proof of concept library. And uh, so, uh, our current library, it's uh, it's we don't really uh, we haven't really looked into the scalability aspect uh, aspect uh, too much. 
our other security aspect too much because it's just a proof of concept uh, that we created for our demonstrator. And um, yeah, so uh, you can probably run maybe 10 to 20 workers with any problem. And sort of you can implement whatever uh, algorithm you want, uh, use it for whatever applica application you want, uh, no problem at all. <clears throat> So given this sort of uh, given this separation of between three, uh, so given this uh, given that now that we've identified these three different sort of layers that we can uh, divide a perpetual learning system into, it's worth actually looking at uh, some of the current frameworks that exist uh, and sort of see how it would fit in. So what I've what I've done here is I've chosen sort of uh, four uh, frameworks that are sort of representative and. Um, we can already see that the fragmentation that I mentioned at the beginning, that's already starting to happen. So uh, yeah, they're, they're all sort of, uh, uh, they're, you can't really sort of use the uh, use them with each other and uh, they don't really interoperate, uh, which seems like, uh, which which will likely cause sort of uh, problems on the line. Uh, yeah, so let's look at like how this sort of four frameworks fit into the uh, framework that we just identified into the sort of, uh, yeah, the layer that you just identified. Uh, so TF Federated and PySwift are sort of uh, are respectively uh, built uh, mainly for TensorFlow and PyTorch. And so the application and algorithm layer are sort of uh, built around TensorFlow and PyTorch and the communication backend layer, uh, uh, it doesn't exist right now for them because they're sort of their own mainly separate sort of simulations. Uh, so, but my understanding is that these are sort of in the works. Uh, so uh, hopefully they'll be uh, implemented in the future. So the other two ones, like Fate, uh, which is from WeBank, uh, it's like a it's like a fairly large API, but uh, the API uh, is uh, and at, at, at my understanding is that it's uh, it's mainly uh, uh, one of the major applications that we look at is uh, finance, and so the stack that they have is sort of specific to sort of uh, 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 Fate, uh, the, the application layer, algorithm layer, uh, API that they have, and the communication backend layer is sort of uh, stack specific to Fate. And Clara, which is developed by NVIDIA uh, mainly for uh, medical applications, again, so they have like um, uh, the application layer and algorithm layer APIs are sort of Clara specific, and they have the like Clara stack for the uh, communication backend. And in contrast, so the little proof of concept library that we have, uh, so that's sort of, uh, you can use any application or algorithm, uh, whatever you want, uh, but they are sort of all built on the sort of common uh, uh, communication backend uh, primitives that are created in the core uh, part of the library. <clears throat> and okay, so that's where you are at. So what are the possible next steps? So I think as a community, so I think, uh, uh, this, the, this, the, uh, the position we're at right now, so we can see like uh, lot, lots and lo lots and lots of startups and people are sort of entering the space, uh, like tremendous amount of research going on. So I think it's a great time to actually sort of as a community sort of figure out uh, uh, what are the what are the common cores that are sort of uh, common across everything and sort of try to build an open, secure, scalable core that can be trusted by everybody and not just for research, but also for sort of deployment as well. And so obviously we need to do additional research into trying to understand what is actually common across all these different systems. And so that we actually, um, uh, we have the right, uh, right sort of infrastructure in place. And yeah, uh, and it's also would be sort of like a great idea to actually explore what kind of potential new business models uh, uh, is made possible by this. So one really nice example is like a federated learning marketplace where a client uh, or a worker can ch choose which federated learning system it chooses to participate in uh, based on, uh, Financial incentives provided or privacy guarantees provided. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah. So yeah, if you have an open sort of infrastructure, uh, it becomes a much more interesting and uh, uh, interesting uh, place. <clears throat> uh, okay. So what are the next steps at Digital Catapult in terms of federal learning? So uh, of, uh, of course, like uh, we're going to sort of continue to sort of help uh, our clients uh, adapt federal learning if uh, if that's actually appropriate for their use case, and we're going to keep. Uh, and we also want to uh, extend the library that you have uh, uh, and uh, build in sort of secure and uh, the security and scalable components that are missing right now and also open source that. Uh, so that's in the, uh, quite soon, we hope to do that. <laughs> and also uh, we're going to be sort of uh, investigating um, uh, additional open source projects uh, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel obviously. So uh, we're going to be investigating sort of open source projects that can collaborate with or build on or extend. Uh, yeah, that's and uh, yeah, that's it for me. And uh, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for uh, uh, listening. And I hope that was useful and enjoy and you enjoyed it. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hassan. And um, I'm going to welcome Blaze and Ollie back onto the screen because we're going to move straight on to the discussion now. Um, and I'm going to start right at the top. So. Um, 
Oli, in your presentation, um, you had quite a shopping list of what you want <laughs> out of privacy preserving machine learning. And no surprise, right at the top was that it preserves privacy. Um, can we examine whether it's actually possible for machine learning to ever be perfectly private? I, yeah, I mean, from everything that we've, we've, um, we've talked to quite a few people on this and, and, and a few different companies, and, and we do think that it is, and I think actually one of the, the strengths of, of, of all of the techniques is, is that um, they hold the promise of being able to almost mathematically say, like, this is definitely private and, and, and we can prove it. And I think that that's actually going to be really necessary to, to help move a lot of these technologies on because if you think about anonymization at the moment one of the challenges of anonymization is you can take a particular data set and say well this, this is anonymized this is great um but then as soon as you're adding more data to it it's um it, you can break that anonymization uh, and so you couldn't you you're never quite sure well is it anonymous in this moment or maybe not or if we add this in maybe maybe it isn't uh, and I think that's 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 where we need to get to that position where we can say no no, no we know we can provably say that this is this is private and, and i think all the different technologies hold that promise in in their in their different ways and i mean i i imagine that you know blaze and, and hassan have, can say more about this from a, from a technical perspective but certainly from from looking across all of them uh, i i do think it's possible is that true is there is it in true in theory but are in, not in practice or not even true in theory blaze do you want to speak to that yeah i think it, I, I would say it depends a little bit on what you mean by private. Um, I think, uh, so one of the, the ideas of privacy, which probably has the strongest guarantee is the one that's called differential privacy. Um, and, and that has this idea that you don't lose very much by being part of a data set. Um, so you, this, this is because a data set will always convey some kind of general uh, ideas of, of behavior. So for example, um, if in general people with, uh, with blonde hair um, you know, are more likely to buy something than something else, then, um, then that, that is just an inherent part of the data set. And so you, you are losing some, well, you are providing some information by giving a data set away with, uh, with that property. Um, what differential privacy tells you is that by you being part of that data set, it's not, it's not very significantly different information uh, that people, that our recipients um, are getting. So I, I would say that's actually a, a pretty good definition of privacy uh, and, and it's quite a strong guarantee for people. Um, in practice, uh, a, a lot of people have struggled to get um, very useful models and information when using differential privacy. Um, so along with the very strong guarantee of privacy, it, it does also come with, in some cases, a, a very strong reduction in the performance of, of the models. Um, that obviously depends on the amounts of data um, that are, are around. Um, yeah, but I, I think, I, I think there, there are aspects of um, privacy that, that are actually guaranteeable. Um, but I, I think, I think it sort of comes down to what what exactly you want by uh, having this idea of privacy. It's a good point. Um, let's not get into definitions of privacy here because that could be a rabbit hole from which we never emerge. So I'm just going to pass on to Hassan and ask him um, in federated learning, particularly whether um, malicious attack can um, can be detrimental to your privacy there. Uh, definitely. So, uh, so malicious attack can have sort of, um, so in federated learning, so you're just not interested in preserving privacy. So that's definitely uh, something that you're interested in. And uh, so malicious, uh, so uh, I think the main motivation for federated learning is that uh, you're not actually sending the data, you're sending the, uh, the model, uh, which is sort of a distillation, uh, distillation of uh, what was not in the data. And uh, so, so, uh, so, yeah, so you you have that sort of first line of defense built into uh, the whole sort of motivation of the system, but at the same time, uh, it turns out that you can actually uh, extract. Uh, in certain cases, you can extract. Uh, a clever person might be able to extract useful information about what kind of data uh, a particular uh, uh, client was sort of saying. So, uh, uh, so in that instance, so like Blaze was saying. Uh, 
you can actually use differential privacy techniques at the individual workers, uh, as an example, uh, to make sure that uh, the model object updates that you send to the server uh, are sort of protected. Uh, but uh, but uh, but that's not foolproof. Uh, uh, in terms of that, even with that kind of system, it, uh, there are cases where uh, whether uh, there's like a malicious uh, actor who sort of uh, either uh, maybe the malicious actor has infiltrated, infiltrated the central server uh, or, uh, or the malicious actor is like uh, someone, a man in the middle, they might still be able to um, uh, able to glean some kind of information from there. So right at this point in time, it's still an open question as to uh, so there are uh, there 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 are sort of uh, lots of um, uh, pr uh, privacy. Uh, you, you can sort of um, uh, you, you can sort of guarantee to some extent that uh, it won't be sort of completely sort of uh, you, all your data won't be completely exposed. But at the same time, uh, it's an open question as to to what extent you're actually protected. Uh, so just to answer yeah. your question, uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's sort of. Um, uh, yeah, there's always a compromise. It's not like a full. The devil is in the detail. I could. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The right way. Yeah, I, I think so the best thing to uh, best thing is to actually uh, uh, you need to be able to uh, uh, trust the server. I think so. I think uh, that's like a uh, best case scenario. So if you can trust the yeah. server, you can sort of put it inside other things. Yeah. Let's let's move on to um, trade offs. So. Um, we know that there are trade-offs in most methods for um, privacy preserving machine learning. They might relate to energy usage or complexity or many other things. Um, I'd like to cover all of those if we can, but first I wanted to go to Oliver and talk about um, maybe in the ethical realm, there might be some conflicts between um, desirable properties that we want from a machine learning system. So you talked about explainability and fairness, uh, but you also, um said i think that you thought that these problems might be solved or will be solved in the future can you speak a bit more to that um, yeah so i i think that some of them might be solved uh and I, uh, as we um talk to a, a few different researchers particularly on explainable ai and, and, and privacy preserving ai that there was a sense in which actually, actually we do think we can bring these together um where I think it's more challenging to, to, to kind of stick with the, the fact that there are still trade-offs is, is say, um, uh, with bias. Actually, I think bias is a great example where you you need to have actually a degree of, of, of personal data because you need to be able to understand whether you are looking at a particular group or not. We we actually had this experience with a, a previous version of, of Everminder, a prototype or remix, where we, we didn't collect any personal data. It was great. We thought we'd done a fantastic job of, of, of data minimization. Uh, and then when uh, our auditors, our external auditors at Etikas came and, and were looking at bias in the model, they said, well, of course, you haven't got any data. You don't know whether this is, this is biased against women or particular groups because you just don't have any data on this. And, and of course, it's one of those moments where you say, ah, oh, yes, <laughs> that is really obvious now you've said that. Um, and hopefully they were able to do some indirect analysis. But um, in that instance, actually, you could have a great privacy preserving AI, but then you, you'd still be potentially stymied if, if you just didn't know anything about, about who you were, you were serving. And, and you might end up in a situation where you'd say, what we should do is um, uh, basically uh, recruit a representative group of our customers to, 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 to actually gather some of their data that they consent to for the purposes of understanding bias. Um, and only that. So we're not trying to use a personal data of anything else, but you're using it for for that purpose. So I think there are some areas where I believe you're probably never going to be able to get away from those trade offs. But but there are others where technically there, there might be some solutions. Blaze, do you have any um, thoughts on trade offs? Yeah, um, I think there are so many trade offs as soon as you get into um, all these ideas around ethics and uh, and, and privacy preserving machine learning. So uh, there are trade-offs between accuracy and privacy. That's a very classic one. Um, and differential privacy actually has a, a very mathematical way of um, defining this. So there's a there are two variables um, that you're allowed to change with differential privacy, um, and they they each have impacts on on accuracy. Um, within ethics, there there are different ideas of what fairness is, um, and there are trade-offs there as well. There's a very nice paper um, 
sort of talking about different ideas of fairness, each of which we we would all kind of agree with, uh, and then proves mathematically that they're impossible to achieve simultaneously, except in very special cases. Um, so I think there are many, many trade-offs um, in, in this space. Uh, as soon as you start bringing in um, ideas around ethics, of which privacy is really just, just one of them, I would say, um, there, uh, there, there are endless uh, trade-offs to, to be had. Actually, in some some ideas of fairness also have a trade-off against accuracy, actually. Mm, uh, yeah. So, it's uh, yeah. multiple objectives to optimize over. Mm. Hassan, is it in federated learning, can you achieve the same accuracy um, in a distribu distributed way than you could if you had all of the data centrally? Uh, no, that's probably not. Uh, that's probably not. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think so, because um, uh, yeah, because you you don't have the data at the central location, and you're sort of uh, uh, you're sort of updating periodically, and yeah. So the, uh, so I think one of the things that happens in federated learning is that when you're actually sort of uh, getting all the updates together, you're not getting the updates from all the workers. You're only selecting a subset of the workers, and then you're getting the updates from them. And additionally, the data distribution across the different workers are likely to be quite different as well. So you have this uh, these two different things that are sort of quite different. You are not getting, you're not using all the data, and you're getting sort of, uh, and the updates that you're getting for the different models are sort of uh, are sort of uh, biased towards the, that, those data sets. So uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's unlikely that you're going to get a model that's as good as if you had all the data in the same location. Uh, yeah. So but but in terms of sort of the uh, the the bias issue, I think uh, so so. The fact that you're actually using only a subset of the workers to uh, create the model that also actually uh, introduces a massive amount of sort of uh, uh, scope to sort of uh, that introduces a lot, a lot of places where sort of bias can seep into your model, uh, both because you're sort of selecting a subset of the workers to do the update and um, and because uh, yeah and so the workers you choose to actually update with. Will actually be will actually sort of uh, ref, uh, change what model you're actually using, mm -hmm. and uh, also for instance, if you're only updating using models uh, using sort of devices uh, that are sort of plugged in at night in North America, then the model that you create will be biased towards the data that's coming from that location. Uh, yeah, so yeah, because of the very distributed nature of the thing, uh, it's really sort of uh, yeah, there are lots of ways sort of bias can seep in. Um, Thanks, Hassan. Yeah, no I think um, we only really have time for one more question. And I, I hope that this, this discussion has encouraged all of the people watching to join us for the Q&A, because there's so much more that we can cover. So I'm going to conclude with this one question. And um, it's to ask if any of the panelists know, are there good examples of privacy preserving machine learning in the wild? <laughs> well, I, I can start with that. I think. Um, I think there are very good examples in uh, in both Apple and Google, uh, where where both of those companies use uh, privacy preserving machine learning to to build keyboard uh, language models. So you know, predicting what you're going to type, um, and both of them have been quite public about uh, trying to push the ideas of privacy preserving machine learning. Of course, they're both companies with with very very large data sets um, and unusually direct access to um, to people's phones, uh, so so I think um, there are some examples of of this in in practice. I think uh, that there's a huge amount of interest in in bringing it uh, to to the more broad uh, ecosystem, but I I wouldn't say there are that many examples publicly, at least, of uh, people using it uh, outside of Google and Apple. Hassan, Oli, anything to add there? Uh, I Plays. I think that there's um, there's not many kind of uh, big uh, kind of headline examples that you can point to. I think there's 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 this really amazing ecosystem that's been developing now and in recent years. Where and there's lots of I think good good examples emerging. I mean, actually, the, the work that Blaze is doing is 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 great in in, in finance. Uh, I know that people we work with in, in duality and Aphoris are also doing good work where they're applying it to specific use cases. And actually, health is a great use case when you're looking at data across hospitals, which I think is 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 simpler than the mobile use case that, that we have for, for our work. So I, I think they're starting to emerge. And um, 
really reflecting what we found that they tend to be quite use case dependent in in terms of the particular technology they end up they end up using okay great i'm going to um i'm going to wrap up here i'm just going to say come and join us for the q a we have there are so many things we haven't covered we haven't covered innovation in business models we haven't covered the resources and tools that are available if you're interested in finding out more or what is the trade-off about doing things openly as opposed to to closed systems. All of these things we can cover in the next hour. I'd like to thank our three speakers. You've been wonderful. Thank you, Hassan, Oli, and Blaze. And hopefully we'll see you all in five or 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Libby, and all of your guests for that absolutely incredible session. So much depth there, and um, I echo what Libby said at the end there. For anyone who's watching, make sure you do go and dive into the Q&A session. It's going to be starting um, at one o'clock in eight minutes' time, or, well, maybe it's not one o'clock, depending on where you're watching on in the world, but here in London, it's one o'clock, and that'll be for half an hour. So do make sure you, you jump over to that Q&A session, um, both to ask your questions, but also, get, as I say, continue the conversation that we've already had for the last last for the last uh, 50 minutes and um, we're going to also have a, a break on this stage if you're staying here at cutting edge and um, the next session is at three o'clock and it is on called on from making a prediction to making a decision why causality matters so again another really interesting topic of discussion here in the cutting edge edge stage if you're not going to the q a with libby and team and um, go and get yourself some food or go and check out some of the other stages there's the expos as well there's also um, plenty of rooms for networking um, and of course you can join the conversation online using the hashtag so enjoy whatever your next step is and we'll see you back here in the cutting edge stage at three o'clock. Thank you very much. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.